Hello everyone, uh, my name is Anton Posniak and I'm the immediate past president of the IAS. I'm also a physician in London and a professor at the London School. Importantly, I'm the non-industry co-chair of the Industry Liaison Forum. And it's my pleasure to open this first round table focusing on accelerating access to long-acting HIV prevention and treatment formulations and delivery platforms the challenges and the opportunities. And this is done in collaboration with the Medicines Patent Pool. Thank you. This first round table will frame the series and present an overview of long acting formulations and delivery platforms for HIV prevention and treatment currently available and in the pipeline. We invite you to attend all three round table sessions, which will appear on your screen now. Now, as a reminder, while you're looking at that, here are a couple of housekeeping rules for the round table. Now it's going to be recorded and the recordings will be made available to the participants and on the IIS website as part of the educational materials in the coming weeks. By staying in this meeting, you can send to be recorded obviously for this portion of the round table. Now we encourage you to send questions to our presenters at any time through the chat function at the bottom of your screen. I mean, most of you have used uh, this Zoom before, so you know perfectly well how to do that. And the questions will be addressed during the panel discussion and throughout this round table. Now, please remember to focus your questions on today's round table theme. Questions about service delivery and access will be covered in more detail at the second and third round table discussion. I'd also like to emphasize that the Industry Liaison Forum aims to provide stakeholders involved in the HIV response with a neutral platform to foster dialogue and action along the HIV prevention, diagnosis and care continuum. We might not find answers to all challenges today, but it's an important step forward in improving access to long acting HIV technologies. And now before starting, I'd like to pass the microphone to my co-chair, Helen McDowell, for a brief introduction. Thanks, Anton. And good morning, good afternoon and good evening, wherever you might be. Uh, my name is Helen McDowell and I head up government affairs and global public health at Vive Healthcare. And I am the industry co-chair of the Industry Liaison Forum. Like Anton, it's a great pleasure to be here today to explore and discuss the opportunities and the challenges in ensuring accelerated access to long acting HIV technologies. So a big warm welcome to all of the participants and also importantly our guest presenters who you can see on the screen. Now due to time that we have today we're not going to give biographies one by one uh, for each of our presenters but you can um, access all of their biographies through the link um, that will be pasted in the chat shortly by um, our colleagues at the IAS. So uh, we'll go first into a round of presentations and these will be followed by a panel discussion where we encourage you to ask clarifying questions and start to discuss the challenges and opportunities, really focusing um, in on, on the scientific side that we are going to be focusing on on this first round table of this series. Um, we've got a packed agenda, um, so I do ask once again very kindly uh, the speakers to not go over their allocated time slots because we're really keen to make sure we do maintain our time for discussion at the end of the session. Now with that, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker as I'm delighted to introduce Michelle Rodolph, who's technical officer with the testing prevention and population team at the WHO and ask her um, to open our session today with her presentation on the upcoming WHO guidelines on long acting formulations and delivery methods for HIV prevention. Thank you. Over to you, Michelle. Thanks for the introduction and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to those of you who are on this call. I thank you to the IAS and the Medicine Patent Pool for inviting WHO to speak. Um, my talk will be on the upcoming guidelines on long-acting formulations and delivery methods for HIV prevention. I am going to give a shout out. Today's my dad's 77th birthday, so this, he would be so proud of me. This is how I'm celebrating his birthday. So let me move on. Um, and please, Helen, if somebody, I'm going to tr keep track of time here. If I go over, just give me a warning. So I just want to start this meeting really quickly with a very brief history of the WHO guidelines. I will try to speak clearly and slowly, but go through these slides quickly. I did pack a lot of information in for 10 minutes. However, I do hope that the slides will be shared so that people can take a look at them at their own leisure later. Um, what I want to say is this is 
this year, 2022, is 10 years since we've had a WHO recommendation on biomedical prevention for HIV. Our first recommendation was on PrEP for serodiscordant couples, MSM, and transgender women. Our most, I'm going to just bring us forward to our most recent recommendation was on the Depibrin vaginal ring, which was released in early 2021. And as is common knowledge, WHO is coming out with a recommendation on long-acting cabotegravir for HIV prevention. The plan is to release that recommendation at IAS this summer. So to speak about long-acting prevention technologies for HIV prevention in general, my colleague Rachel Bagley developed this slide, which I think, which I really like because I do like how it shows how we have TDF as oral TDF-FTC is oral PrEP for all people. So I won't, not, um, anyway. Um, but we do have a range of other long-acting prevention methods in the pipeline. So just to read them out, we have the um, broad, broad, um, oh God, I got to, the BNAVs for now. <laughs> the Depivirin vaginal ring, injectable capitigravir is in the pipeline. TAF is latrivir implant, um, which I'll get to later, HIV, HIV vaccine, and other MPTs. Now, this slide was borrowed, not stolen, from Mitchell Warren from AVAC, which he presented earlier this week, just to give an idea of years, how it's, the pipeline looks in terms of time to market. And I think what I really like about this slide is it gives a nice it's a very nice visual looking at what we have in terms of long-acting prevention. And also in terms of what's in the pipeline for oral prep, FTC, TAF, um, the trials with FTC, TAF, looking at also lenacapovir and zlatavir, those have been paused for now. I'm not gonna get into that in my presentation, but I do think that it's good to put it out there that these are coming. Dual prevention pill, which is a combined oral contraceptives and TDFTC. We're hoping to have regulatory approval and introduction 2024. Um, Long-acting injectables, again, cabotegravir, lenacapavir is paused, but cabotegravir, we should have a WHO guideline recommendation in the middle of this year. We should have in inclusion in the WHO list for pre-qualified medications later this year. And the vaginal ring has received WHO guidance and is on the pre-qualification list. So we know that oral PrEP is highly efficacious, but coverage has been low, impact has been low and has had lower impact outside of MSM communities and high income countries. And there's the hope, there's the strong possibility that new products could overcome these current issues. New products offer choice and may increase demand. And new products can overcome barriers to current biomedical prevention choices in terms of acceptability, adherence, and effective or effective use, continuation, and also addressing renal and other safety issues. However, as with as we know from our experience with new products, we do need to ensure additional monitoring to make sure that we can ensure safety. With that said, there are structural issues and stigma and discrimination in the health sector, and these will remain key barriers to any new product success. So here is just a, um, with, with help from Rachel Bagley, just mapped out the pros and cons and issues of the different products. Um, I'm just gonna see. So in terms of issues, it looks, we, we know we mapped out that Oral PrEP, we do know it's over 90% protective against HIV. We know it's acceptable. However, there are ad adherence issues with daily use. Safety is a minor issue. Drug resistance is also a minor issue. Um, to paper and vaginal ring, what we understand is efficacy is probably around 50%, but could be as high as 70%. There's no safety issues. Testing straightforward and other lab monitoring is not needed. Acceptability, it's in, in terms of cons, it's a new modality in low middle income countries. And to date, we still have no real world implementation. I'm not gonna discuss the issues right now in the name of time, but as I said, I hope that um, these slides are shared. Cabotegravir, we know from the trials that it's efficacious, 
possibly more efficacious for women than men, but this we still need to look at the data in more detail before making any before making coming to that conclusion. Um, the intramuscular injection could limit the potential for self-care, and we have no real-world implementation experience. Now, for those of you who are not that familiar with the Depepin vaginal ring and the w, as the WHO's recommendation, I've just included two slides on it here to just share the wording of the recommendation that following a guideline development group meeting, the Depibrin vaginal ring may be offered as an additional prevention choice for women at substantial risk of HIV infection as part of combination prevention approaches. Current evidence, however, suggests that oral daily prep when taken as prescribed has greater efficacy for HIV prevention than the Depibrin vaginal ring. Oral prep should also be offered at sites where the ring is provided to enable women to make choices, meaning a choice between two options versus only being offered one option. The implementation consideration slash resource gaps, we really want to inc include addressing the provision of the ring as part of comprehensive services, ensure women are informed with the full information in order to make choice about the benefits and potential risks when considering to use the ring, support adherence and demand creation. Also acknowledge that adolescent girls and young women may need more support during initiation for continuation. One um, point from the Cabotegravir trials, and specifically 084, that I think needs to be highlighted over and over again is yes, we saw Cabotegravir highly efficacious, effective, but we also saw just how well oral prep worked in the women assigned to the oral prep arm. What I take from that is if women are offered the correct support and um, the correct environment, women can take oral prep. And we really need to learn from this because this does support having more options and choices for women. Um, for the Depibrin Ring, we are seeking to gain more information on acceptability among women from key population groups. Sex workers were not specifically targeted to be included in any of the studies. And then just to jump ahead, um, further information on safety in pregnancy and breastfeeding is being researched right now, funded by the MTN with the, the trials be protected and deliver. I know they're moving ahead and what I understand is the information, the data collected to date continues to support that ring is safe during pregnancy and breastfeeding. So long acting injectable cavitator rear. And my clock says I have two more minutes. I might take three if that's okay, Helen. Um, so just to jump ahead, implementation issues. So to start off with populations and approaches. Um, we know that the only information we have on implementing CABITEC long-acting injectable CAP is from trials. So we do need more real-world data. And that includes more real-world data on offering CAP to specific key populations, in particular sex workers and people who use and inject drugs. And not included here is also transgender men. These are three key population groups that were not specifically included in the trials. For transgender women, the issue to be addressed is alternative injection sites for trans women with buttocks implants or fillers. They were excluded from the trials and there's a desire to find out alternative ways that we can include trans women. Model delivery, should we be offering this within current PrEP programs, key population services, anti SRH services, key population services? These are all questions that we hope that implementation science will address. And I believe I have only two more slides. The really specific implementation issues at WHO that we've been discussing ad nauseum is um, covering the tail to avoid the potential, potential serial conversions and drug resistance. In the trials, people were counseled to take oral TDFFTC for 12 months. We don't know if that's really gonna work in a real world setting, especially if people feel they're no longer at risk. And what are our other options if people aren't? What is the wiggle room with restarting Cabotegravir after missed appointments? These are implementation issues we hope the implementation of science agenda will address. And HIV testing. This is a big question right now. 
Um, the challenge is initiation of cabotegravir if cabotegravir is initiated during the acute phase and those, seric those HIV infections are missed. The issue of delayed diagnosis and if this could contribute to drug resistance, modeling implies it should not be a big issue, but we need real world experience. And we do hope that NAT testing will not be the only option for offering long acting injectable cabotegravir in the real world. So I had, that's it. I think I'm at time. Um, I know my colleague Heather Marie Schmidt, who is WHO and UNAIDS, is in the audience. I give her a big shout out to all the support she's provided in the development of this work. Um, I also want to give a shout out to Robin Schaefer and Rachel Bagley. And that's it. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks so much, uh, Michelle, for that overview of what's currently there and the WHO perspective on it. Uh, and now we're going to uh, have the next four speakers and there's, we're going to have a series of rapid fire perspectives. Uh, and they're coming from community and civil society representatives on these long acting formulations and delivery platforms. We're going to start with pre-recorded perspectives from Brent Allen, who occupies several senior advisory positions focusing on programs and policies for global and domestic agencies and industry partners. And then Rahab Mawaniki, who's a civil society leader and public health specialist with vast experience in the TB and HIV fields. And then Moses Supercharger in Subulga, who is a musician, radio and TV presenter and an HIV advocate. I just think long acting technologies are something that we've been waiting for for so long, you know, for ever since the advent of antiretroviral therapy from like 96, it was always pills, 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 you know, first the pills, there was like a quantum of them and they were like so many at so many different difficult times with so many different like side effects. And then all of a sudden became the one pill tech where you could combine everything into one pill but now we with these new delivery devices i think we're talking about um the notion of you know ad adhering or attending to what it means to live with hiv with all of the other things going on in your life you know we're living well you know, many of us may not be flourishing, but these drugs have saved our lives and they keep us alive. And I think, you know, the new technologies are about giving us better options, better accessibility, better usability. And I think what is most important here, and this is my call out, right, to the industry and to the community, is that we have to be prepared to keep being invested in innovation, right? Because let's, let's look at the possibilities. If we open our minds to innovation, right? Nasal sprays, dermal uh, patches, vaginal rings, implants, all of these things are possible once we start talking about long acting drugs. And I just think we talk about the long acting drugs, we talk about the new delivery me methodologies, and we combine them together. That's the future, not just in terms of HIV drug delivery, but a whole host of other drug delivery. I think, I think with regard to accessibility, one of the things we have to understand that there's safety and efficacy uh, constraints that we have to contend with. And, you know, let's, let's look back in our history, right? Like, let's look back. A lot of the drugs that we first started on were had to be administered through healthcare systems, through healthcare professionals, and they have moved to a different, to patient user methodologies. I think this is what's going to happen now. I mean, this is the new frontier in uh, delivery devices and uh, delivery tech, you know, is that it's user friendly, that I can do it at home without specific training or even minimal training. But, you know, it used to be that you used to have to go and get your pills dispensed, you know, every fortnight or whatever, or even worse, you know, some of the other drugs, you know, you had to go into the hospital and have to get them every day. You know, let's accept no one wants to sacrifice safety and efficacy, 
But what we do want is usability and access accessibility, but that comes in time. Let's be patient. Let's um, support this tech so that we can have those options into the future. I want to appreciate that the fact that uh, there has been tremendous uh, improvement in terms of HIV treatment. Um, the introduction of long acting treatments uh, is a welcome move because it, will, it has its own benefits. And one of it is um, that people living with HIV will have an option of uh, ensuring that uh, the pill burden is taken away from them. Uh, the other benefit is that uh, the frequency to go to the facilities when they stock out will also be reduced. Uh, therefore, I think it is an, a very welcome move to, uh, in terms of moving forward, in terms of um, engaging uh, in R&D for HIV and also ensuring that people are the also to treatment. But on the other side, we need to be cautious of the fact that um, uh, there's still high stigma and uh, you do not want to be in a position that you're now even stigmatizing the issue of uh, having injectables in terms of treatment. And sometimes, and you know, treatment can only be injected by a trained health worker. And for the Kenyan government, it is actually a nurse and nobody else, uh, or maybe a doctor. And then also um, the fact that uh, a person has to be going to the facility uh, after a period of, after some period in between the treatment, it also shows that there's a, there's a, there's a, a cost incurred in terms of transport. Because right now, in term, when we do treatment adherence for people living with HIV, for pills, if I am not able to go to the clinic, I can send my treatment body to go and get for me and give uh, feedback about um, my outcome. So we need to be cautious also of the rural settings where we do not have much technology. Uh, if you look at the family planning uh, model, which this may want to copy, it has worked in some regions, but in some regions it has not worked. Why? Because there has to be the technology alert to ensure that people are reminded when they should go for their next uh, course of treatment. Uh, and if this is not happening, then we will have uh, the gains that we've accrued over the years uh, being lost. Uh, of course, I also want to appreciate that sometimes we have stockouts. So if one, and I know if somebody starts um, taking treatment uh, through injection, then we do not want to get to a point where they are not able to continue the same. They have to go back to the pills. So, and then the other um, issue we need to be cautious about, about communities, that community needs to be empowered. The people in HIV needs to know that I am taking this treatment. What are the side effects? What are the benefits? And uh, how they can mitigate uh, even when the other issues that cannot foresee at this time. So, but all in all, I want to say that we, we want to appreciate uh, advancement in technology uh, and also noting that um, uh, we are cautious of, uh, we are now more technological savvy. And so everything, uh, if communities are put at the center of the response, I think uh, the outcome will be much appreciated. Thank you. Long-acting therapy formulations for both prevention and treatment of HIV can be a fundamental game changer in stopping new infections and uplifting health standards of us people living with HIV. But this intervention will not yield fantastic results if the following factors are, are not addressed. One, education. People in Africa know very little about this intervention which will directly affect demand and optimal adherence. We have seen this issue concern in daily oral prep. People in Africa only demand for what they know about. What it is, how it was made is really also very important. Therefore, more energy is needed towards educating the grassroots people about long-acting therapy intervention. 
the only way we can entice the funders and programmers to buy these medications for the general population is by showing the cost effectiveness of this intervention. How much do you plan to spend on daily art in the next 10 years? And how much will you save when you instead import long acting therapy? If we can't answer those two questions convincingly, the funders will not buy these products. In low and middle income countries, the policymaker and the person buying the prevention and treatment therapies control what to buy. So it's really very, very important that we target these people and uh, educate them about what's going on. Yeah, since the product is new, little knowledge about pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. We still need to learn about the pharmacokinetics of these interventions. Otherwise, the people will not accept them. For a product to succeed, it must be friendly and accessed by all groups of people, including adolescents, pregnant mothers, and folks with comorbidities. We must also look at the possibility of targeting the sabotagers, the people who will come and sabotage the intervention. We must also find ways of fighting the myth and misconceptions that will crop up when this intervention comes. We are seeing this in accessing uh, COVID-19 vaccines. People are not taking the product because of the myth and misconceptions. So if we start now, we can address that challenge. Thank you so much. So thank you very much indeed uh, to all three, Brent, Rahab, and Moses. They're all in the audience and they're gonna take part in the panel discussion at the end of the series for any questions you have for them. Uh, and now lastly, I want to give the floor to Kenley Sequesi, who coordinates the African Community Advisory Board, AfroCab, and collaborates with the treatment advocacy and literacy, literacy campaigns to promote um, greater um, uh, uh, access to uh, information for people who are live or are affected by uh, uh, AIDS, GPA, in the National HIV Response. Uh, now, Kenley, do you have any additional points to mention along acting formulations and delivery platforms? Unfortunately, Anton, I believe Kenley has been dropped out of the call. Um... Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, that happens with this technology. Uh, never mind. We'll, we'll have to wait for him to come back. So maybe what we should do is uh, I'll pass over to Helen and then we can have the next four speakers and then we'll try and uh, get back to Kenley when, he's, uh, when he reconnects. Re, um, Helen. Perfect. Thanks, Anton, and, and thanks to our community speakers. So up next, uh, we're going to get into the into into the uh, scientific pieces um, from a number of experts from industry. Uh, but first, uh, we will hear from Charles Flexner, who is professor of the medicine in the Division of Clinical Pharmacology and Infectious Diseases, and professor of pharmacology and molecular sciences at the John Hopkins University School of Medicine. And so. Uh, Charlie, over to you to give us an oversight of all of the different pieces of long acting uh, innovations that are in the pipeline. Thank you. Hello, I'm Charlie Flexner from Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, and we're going to be talking about the pipeline for long acting drugs for treatment and prevention. So, this talk will cover agents that are in development. Uh, I'm not going to talk about cabotegravir and rolpivirine. Uh, but I am going to talk about some agents that hopefully will be available to you very soon. Uh, here are my uh, disclosures of potential conflicts. I'm going to talk about agents in terms of their routes of delivery. And let's start with the simplest route of delivery, that is long-acting oral antiretroviral drugs. Now, Islatravir is a nucleoside analog with a unique mechanism of action uh, that inhibits reverse transcriptase by preventing translocation, making it a nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor. This is a drug with a very long half-life in plasma and an active uh, intracellular triphosphate with an even longer half-life. 
uh, Islatravir has very potent activity against HIV in clinical studies, and it was in development because of its extraordinarily extraordinary extraordinary potency and long half life uh, in both an oral weekly version for treatment and an oral monthly version for PrEP. Now, as you're probably all aware, last November, a Merck had to pause the development of this drug because of um, the findings of uh, lymphopenia uh, in most studies involving Islatravir in both HIV seronegative and HIV seropositive subjects. The Food and Drug Administration in the United States placed all Islatravir studies on full or partial hold and the only ongoing studies with this drug are the daily oral Islatravir uh, regimens in combination with Doravirine. Now, Islatravir was also in development with this drug, MK8507, a once weekly non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor for HIV treatment as an oral two drug combination. And Merck has announced that they do not intend to develop MK8507 as a standalone to combine with other agents. And so that means not just one drug, but two drugs uh, that were very promising oral agents for long acting therapy are now on hold. There are important questions about Islatravir associated lymphopenia, um, including whether or not lower doses of Islatravir will meet safety and efficacy targets. Merck has announced publicly that um, lower doses of Islatravir do not appear to be associated with the same degree of lymphopenia, and there may be doses that have no uh, long-term lymphopenia at all. In addition, they have reported that their 12-week implant studies with Islatravir in HIV seronegative volunteers produced no lymphopenia. So it is possible that uh, other doses and other delivery routes might circumvent this uh, toxicity. It's also important to consider whether there are patient populations for whom Islatravir would never be an appropriate drug because of the risks associated with lymphopenia and associated reductions in CD4 cell counts. Uh, and finally, as I said, the possibility that other delivery platforms like implants might not produce lymphopenia. I'm going to switch now to other implantable antiretroviral drugs, and the one agent that's in clinical development in an implant form for HIV prevention um, is tenofovir alafenamide, or TAF. This is an example of an inert TAF implant, in this case, a silicon scaffold with pores that deliver the unmodified drug at a very slow rate. Um, this drug produces, this implant produces concentrations of tenofovir uh, and tenofovir diphosphate, the active metabolite, in peripheral blood mononuclear cells for a very long period of time in, um, in laboratory animals after a single implant. Now, um, a, a number of uh, tenofovir alafenamide implants have been tested in animal models and some of them have proven to produce quite severe local toxicity, including tissue necrosis. But this is an analysis from a review that was published uh, last year in AIDS Research in Human Retroviruses, showing that the degree of local toxicity with a TAF implant may be related to the daily release rate of this drug um, with some implants that release the drug quite rapidly, producing severe local toxicity, and other implants that release the drugs quite slowly, producing little or no local toxicity. And that suggests that it may be possible to develop a TAF implant that would be tolerable for long-term use in humans. It's also important to note that a TAF implant would not only prevent or treat HIV, but would also prevent or treat hepatitis B virus infection, uh, making it, it a doubly interesting as a potential future product. I'm gonna switch now to subcutaneous antiretrovirals. And the most exciting of these, and certainly the most advanced, is the HIV capsid inhibitor, linacapavir, being developed by Agiliad. This drug has multiple sites of action to prevent assembly of the HIV capsid, 
its mechanism of action and uh, the development of, of resistance to this drug is unique amongst antiretrovirals with no overlapping resistance with other uh, ARVs. Uh, Gilead has requested regulatory approval for this drug based on the results of the Capella study, a study conducted in heavily treatment experienced patients with multi-class resistance to other antiretrovirals. They presented the results of this study last year at CROI, um, and they showed that, uh, that uh, lenacapavir added to an optimized background regimen substantially reduced viral load in the majority of recipients. The, the people who participated in this study are now receiving lenacapavir as an every six month subcutaneous dose. Now, one of the things that complicates the administration of lenacapavir is because the drug has an exceedingly long half-life, uh, it has the requirement for an oral loading dose given over uh, two weeks, followed by the every six month the subcutaneous injections of the maintenance dose. And as you can see here, the current loading dose for lenacapavir involves two 600 milligram doses at days one and two of dosing, followed uh, seven days later by a 300 milligram loading dose, and then seven days after that, the uh, maintenance dose uh, uh, given every six months. And, and so in terms of implementation, uh, to uh, use this drug for HIV treatment or prevention will be a little more complicated than other long-acting formulations we've been, uh, we have been uh, used to so far. I'll switch next and talk about intravenous antiretrovirals and the um, leading uh, class of drugs in this pipeline category are the broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibodies. There are quite a few of these in clinical development currently, indicated on this figure from the Vaccine Research Center at the National Institutes of Health. The blue circles indicate um, uh, monoclonal antibodies that, are, that have uh, been tested in clinical development, and some of these are in clinical development currently. Now, one of the nice things about broadly neutralizing antibodies is that a simple two amino acid change in the FC binding domain of the uh, broadly neutralizing antibody greatly extends its plasma half-life. And the examples here from this published uh, figure are what happens with two broadly neutralizing uh, antibodies, VRCO1 and VRCO7, after this two amino acid LS mutation in the FC receptor. And what you can see in the green and the blue is that both VRCO1 and VRCO7 have their half-lives greatly extended by this two amino acid mutation to the point where uh, instead of having to administer these antibodies every one to three months, uh, you could now administer them every six months and maintain concentrations above the target for inhibiting or preventing HIV which is 10 micrograms per milliliter. Next, I'm gonna talk about transdermal antiretrovirals. For many years, we said antiretrovirals were not potent enough for transdermal administration, but this technology, the microarray or micro needle patch, makes it possible to deliver uh, antiretrovirals in ways that could uh, uh, convert them to transdermal long-acting formulations. These are products, devices, that are cast in molds. There is an adhesive border on the outside of the patch. Uh, the uh, patch is pressed into the skin so that these microneedles enter the subdermal space, and then the adhesive patch is removed. If the patch consists of nanoformulated nanoparticles, then those nanoparticles enter the subdermal space and then the subcutaneous space and form a subcutaneous depot that gradually releases drug over a very long time, much as we're used to with intramuscular cabotegravir or rilpivirine. So here are data from Ryan Donnelly's group at the University, at Queen's University in Belfast showing the pharmacokinetics of 
three different Cavitegrigor formulations in laboratory rats. Um, and what this uh, study has shown us is that it is possible to deliver cavitegravir with two different kinds of microarray patches or micro needle patches shown in these electro, electro, electron micrographs. Um, and in the red, you can see that the nano formulated transdermal patch uh, releases cavitegravir uh, slowly over a period of more than four weeks to achieve concentrations that exceed the target for inhibiting, uh, and for inhibiting uh, HIV. Um, now, it's important to point out that intramuscular cavitegravir, um, given at, as the same formulation as currently approved, does produce higher concentrations with a lower dose. And so we still have work to do if we want to be able to deliver cavitegravir with a transdermal patch and achieve concentrations similar to that that are being achieved with the intramuscular um, nano formulation that's currently approved. But this is nonetheless a very exciting development and the possibility of self-administered long-acting cavitegravir with a patch. What will the future hold for um, long-acting antiretrovirals for treatment and prevention? Well, I think it's going to hold a lot. There are a number of different formulations and agents in clinical, in early preclinical development and some in clinical development, including, as we mentioned, transdermal microneedle patches. There are new implant technologies that may apply to other antiretrovirals besides TAF and Islatrovir. Um, there are bioerodible implants that would not have to be uh, uh, delivered surgically or removed surgically at the end of their lifespan. Um, there are combination technologies, for example, that would deliver the pivirine and hormonal contraceptives in the same ring. There are gastric reservoirs that could deliver other antiretrovirals orally. And finally, uh, there are strategies being applied to reduce the injection volume for intramuscular uh, uh, antiretrovirals like cavitegravir and lopivirine that would make them much more convenient to use. Um, finally, I want to mention that this is a very rapidly moving field and a very active field with a lot going on. Um, I didn't have the chance to mention a number of agents in early development, including uh, agents for delivery of anti of, uh, of dalyotegravir, um, uh, emtricitabine, or, or lamivudine, and tenofovir uh, subcutaneously so that TLD, the oral drug we're all used to, could be given subcutaneously, including, for example, to pediatric patients. This is work being uh, 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 supported by Unitaid and um, is uh, taking place at the University of Washington, the so-called GLAD project as well as projects to develop long-acting formulation for prevention of tuberculosis and malaria, uh, the Longevity Project also approved uh, and supported by Unitaid. Um, and keeping track with these developments is not easy, but here is a resource that will help you do that. This is the Long-Acting Technologies Patents and Licenses Database uh, that has been uh, 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 put together by the Medicines Patent Pool. It's available at this web link. And um, this is, uh, uh, I think, a resource that will allow you to keep up with uh, long-acting formulations in uh, preclinical and clinical development. Um, we will be um, augmenting this website uh, in, in collaboration with my group, the Long-Acting Extended Release Antiretroviral Research Resource Program, LEAP. And so this will soon be a medicines patent pool and LEAP uh, uh, collaboration uh, to help everyone involved in this field keep up with, with the latest developments. So I want to thank by acknowledging uh, the, my many collaborators, uh, my funding sources, um, and uh, would also refer you to um, our website, uh, the longactinghiv.org website the, uh, for um, the latest on what's happening with uh, conferences, publications, funding resources, and, and other uh, valuable educational materials to help you keep up with um, what I think 
is the most exciting uh, uh, thing happening in HIV treatment and prevention right now. And that is this very robust pipeline uh, of new products and new drugs. Thanks, and I'll be happy to take questions and, and discussion uh, during the discussion section at the end of the session today. Thanks, Charles. Um, great to have you, and thanks for that really clear overview. I, I'm now going to invite Alex Reinhardt, um, who is Medicines Development Lead for HIV Prevention in the Research and Development Team at Vive Healthcare, uh, to provide updates on, on Vive Healthcare's work in the long-acting space. Alex, over to you, and just a reminder of five minutes, please. Yes, great. Thank you very much, Helen, and thank you, Charlie, for a great introduction. And Mel, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so what I'd like to do for just the next few minutes is provide a little bit more of an update on, on what Charlie has provided from the Vive perspective. And this figure probably looks familiar um, to the one that, that Charlie presented. And it's a schematic of all the, the phases in, in the, the virus life cycle, at which uh, drugs could potentially intervene um, and the purpose of this slide is to show that Vive actually has a number of molecules um, at many of these steps uh, that are currently in clinical development, starting with um, the broadly neutralizing antibody N6LS that, that um, Charlie just referenced, and then moving to um, our entries for NRTTIs, um, and then uh, reverse transcription um, of course, um, and then with the capsid, um, and then you can see the integration step is really kind of the core of the, the Vive portfolio uh, with the integrase inhibitors. Obviously, everyone's familiar with dolutegravir. Cabotegravir now is starting to see more approvals for treatment. Uh, we saw our first approval for prevention with the US FDA in December, hopefully with many more approvals yet to come. Um, and then there's now a third generation integrase inhibitor, um, VH184, which is now in preclinical uh, testing as well. Um, then you can see <clears throat> um, we have additional entries in the preclinical phase for capsid, um, as well as uh, phase one and two work going on for maturation inhibitors. And then the final slide, Nelly, on, on the next one. Uh, is providing yet a little bit more detail uh, with respect to timelines for when we might be able to expect some of these to come through. These are very early phase, early stage molecules, um, but we will begin to see data emerge now both this year and next year as well, um, looking at a more concentrated formulation of cabotegravir, um, and then a few agents, um, both cabotegravir and the broadly neutralizing antibody N6LS um, in combination with something called PH20. And PH20 is recombinant human hyaluronidase. Um, and this comes from a partnership that we uh, joined in with a company called Halozyme last year. And the idea here is that hyaluronidase, when it's injected subcutaneously under the skin, um, <clears throat> proteolizes uh, extracellular matrix, um, creates a pocket in which you can inject uh, large volumes of whatever drug that you want to deliver, whether it's a large or a small molecule drug. Um, the advantage here is, here is that it gives you the opportunity to deliver larger volumes and therefore larger quantities of drug and hopefully therefore pushing um, dosing intervals uh, out much further in time. So we will see data um, from these very early studies um, coming this year. Next year, we will see data with PH20 as well with our NRTTI uh, and our capsid inhibitor uh, as well. And I believe some work is still ongoing with rolpivirine uh, and PH20. <coughs> so then moving towards 2024, we're looking for the selection of a partner molecule that would go um, with either cabotegravir or N6LS and PH20. Obviously for treatment, we can't uh, administer these as monotherapy. So um, we will be selecting a, a long acting partner that would be um, paired up with, with these um, new early, early stage molecules. Um, and that goes for um, the treatment regimen as well. 
uh, with both of these now with candidate selection being progressed to the phase 2B3 stage. And then with a target launch window somewhere beginning in 2025 of a first self-administered long acting regimen for treatment. Um, and then an ultra long acting um, cabotegravir um, for prevention uh, with PH20. And then additional um, uh, launches coming in the 2027 um, and 2030 plus um, phase as well. Um, looking at uh, long acting regimens as well, greater than it uh, or greater than three months, uh, administered every three months or uh, at least every six months. So, um, Helen, I will go ahead and stop there and, and pass it back to you. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Um, great to hear those updates. Uh, and now I, I'd like to introduce our last speaker before we go into our discussion. And that is Martin Ree, who is the Executive Director of Virology Clinical Research at Gilead Sciences. Um, so uh, Martin, over to you to give us an update from Gilead. Thank you. On behalf of the participants in all of our clinical studies, clinician investigators and Gilead team, I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present our first-in-class long-acting HIV capsid inhibitor, lenacapavir. Now, I'd like to go over our phase two, three study, Capella, in heavily treatment experienced people with HIV. Capella is a phase two, three study in heavily treatment experienced people with multi-drug resistant HIV who are failing their current regimen. The study had randomized and non-randomized cohort. Within the randomized cohort, there were 14 days of functional monotherapy period, which was followed by the maintenance period. During the functional monotherapy period, linacapavir or placebo were added to a failing regimen. During the maintenance period, participants started an optimized background regimen, which was constructed by the study investigator. I will not go over in detail the baseline characteristics, but will only point out that the participants in the study were very sick with lots of resistance to many of the HIV drugs and heavily immunocompromised with low CD4 cell count. During the 14 days of functional monotherapy period, linacapavir group had close to two log decline, showing a very robust antiviral activity. Over the next 26 and 52 weeks, in combination with the optimized background regimen, 81% and 83% achieved virologic suppression. We also saw a robust CD4 cell recovery with mean of 83 cell increase over 52 weeks. These are really meaningful increase, especially when your CD4 cell count is less than 200 or 50 and you are at risk of life-threatening opportunistic infections. From safety standpoint, linacapavir was well tolerated. Common adverse events were diarrhea and nausea. There were no serious adverse events related to lenacapavir. Common injection site reactions were swelling, erythema, pain, nodule, and induration. Most injection site reactions were grade one and lasted only for days. Induration and nodule lasted for weeks to months. Importantly, only one participant discontinued linacapavir due to injection site reactions. Now, I'd like to share with you our one-year data from Calibrate. Calibrate is a phase two induction maintenance study of linacapavir. We enrolled 182 treatment naive people with HIV and randomized them. In the first two groups, Subcutaneous linacapavir was combined with oral daily EPTAF in the first six months, then later with either oral daily TAF or Bictegravir as part of a two-drug regimen. In the third group, 
oral linocapavir was combined with oral daily FTAF. Comparator group was BFTAF or uh, Bictarvi. In the first six months, all three linocapavir groups achieved over 90% of urologic suppression, and over the next six months, most maintained their suppression. In the first few weeks, it's also impressive that the three linocapavir lines overlap with treatment group four, the comparator group in light green, which is the insti containing regimen, which is known to achieve virologic suppression fast. Today, I shared with you the clinical data of linocapavir, showing the efficacy and safety of linocapavir in combination with other agents. We also have two large phase three studies in prevention ongoing. Overall, we're very excited about the potential of linocapavir for treatment and prevention of HIV to address the diverse needs of people with HIV. I'd like to thank you for your attention and would be happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you very much indeed. They were really exciting presentations and it gives us a good picture of where we might be going with HIV. And I agree with Charlie, it's a really exciting time to be in HIV research. Um, now, we're going to have a panel discussion and I'm going to ask uh, Gustavo Doncel um, from Conrad, the uh, Contraceptive Research and Development. He's the Scientific and Executive Director and the Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology and microbiology and molecular cell biology at Eastern Virginia Medical School. He's done a lot of pioneer work on microbiocides, HIV prevention products and contraception. Over to you, Gustavo. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Anton. I'm uh, mindful of the time. I think we're running a little bit behind. So I wonder if I can speak speed up my, my presentation. In any case, this uh, what I attempt to, to present is, is an overview of the challenges and, and opportunities that, that are um, associated to the development of long-acting formulations. Um, uh, long-acting formulations have the, their unique set of challenges. Today, we're going to concentrate on developmental challenges more than, uh, than access or the challenges related to access and service delivery. Um, so I don't know who's in control. I, I intend to present, <laughs> but, but um, in any case, I think this is about the rationale. Uh, and I think we, we, we all know why um, the uh, long acting delivery systems and long acting formulations bring something to the table. So next, uh, with that um, is, um, there are opportunities, uh, obviously, to be realized, um, and uh, and again, we went through this. And uh, there's a clear opportunity to increase method and product choice, to increase acceptability, and therefore uptake and continuation. Clearly, to increase adherence, um, possibly to decrease uh, PK fluctuations, which will, um, in theory, lead to a better safety and efficacy profile decrease the number of uh, visits to the clinic, perhaps monitoring. And, and there is an overall potential to decrease costs and to increase cost effectiveness, which was cited as a critical point for, for decision makers. Next, however, like all innovation, uh, it, it, there, there, there have its sets of uh, challenges. And in my uh, slides, this was animated, so they didn't look so busy. <laughs> but but um, so the, the challenge is really, uh, the way I see uh, the, the development of long acting drug delivery systems is it they do entail a high demand for the R&D process. For starters, they require a specific type of APIs, effective pharmaceutical ingredients, high potency, low uh, solubility, those are the best molecules. And there are not that many out there in the public domain that fit this bill. The, the platforms are typically more complex than the short acting uh, uh, platforms like tablets. They entail a long um, preclinical and IND enabling um, set of studies uh, just by nature. 
And of course, the characterization of the PK tail that now we're seeing in clinical trials also uh, is typically characterized in the preclinical uh, stages and, and requires long time. Um, there's a high bar for safety because the drug persists in the body for a long time. So side effects now need to be avoided and maybe magnified by the fact that you can, in many cases, remove the, the, the drug from the body in, a ca in case of an idiosyncratic reaction or, or a side effect. There, the longer period also uh, allows for more concurrent infections, some of which may, may not be compatible with the drugs that are being administered. And of course, more drug-drug interactions. Uh, there may be a need, and it was mentioned here, for, a, for the development of a short acting platform for the same drug. At, for an oral lead-in, uh, for a bridging between two uh, dosings uh, or, or missing uh, doses, and for tail coverage. And, uh, and so that, uh, that is a parallel path, which clearly complicates the process of the dynamic. Uh, it was mentioned that these need to be user-friendly, and I cannot agree more with that. The, the, these are, we're talking about implants or injectables, high volume injectables. They need to be user-friendly or else we're, we're not going to realize some of the opportunities we, we, we discussed before. Long-term uh, stability and shelf life, low cost of, uh, of uh, goods and, and storage and distributions, particularly for LMIC, are challenges to the development. And overall, these lead to a higher developmental cost and investment by the product developer. Uh, the next one is it's my, my summary of challenges on implementation and access, and I'm going to skip that again, again in the, trying to, to give as much time to the panel as, as, as possible. The, the slides will be distributed, and these two topics will be discussed uh, further in the two next webinars. So I've come to an end with this overall very speedy presentation. I have three questions just to, to warm up the panel. Uh, we can go with them or, or go with the panel directly, but I'm going to leave the, uh, I'm going to read them quickly. Uh, what has been, this is the first one is particularly for the product developers in the panel. What has been the most challenging step in the R&D process of the long acting ARV products that have been recently approved or that are currently in development? For, for the community representatives and, and, and implementers, in terms of product attributes, what are the expectations for and most important features of new long-acting ARV formulations, especially again from the policymaker, implementers, and community end user perspectives? And finally, how can new long-acting ARV formulations be developed? What product attributes should be considered to facilitate implementation in low resource settings? With that, I'm going to pass the baton back to Anton. Hopefully I uh, recover some of the time. Thanks, Gustavo. Uh, and thanks for the questions. They're very thought provoking. Uh, um, so if we can put them back up, uh, I don't know what happened to the slide there, but I just wanted as Kenley's back online, Kenley, you're there. I wondered if we could just ask you about number two and then perhaps ask some more, uh, then spread this to the community. Uh, what are your expectations? Um, about the attributes for these uh, long actings, because after all, you know, we already we have injectables are, are there already. If you take two monthly, uh, other things are in the pipeline. But what do you think, from a community perspective, especially from low middle income countries, the uh, attributes and expectations would be? Kenley. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks, Anton. Sorry, I joined a little late, but. I think it's all of the above. Be, uh, you know, I, th I think the um, idea, you know, I think what we want to see is as the technologies sort of evolve and become available, they become accessible to low and middle income countries. We are aware of the fact that yes, injectables are probably the, the first ones to come out. They may not be ideal for everybody, but it's exciting to see the number of options that are emerging, the uh, implants, the, um, you know, the long, the, you know, sort of long, longer tails of infusions and so on. So I think, you know, it, it's, it's probably very early to tell which ones might 
uh, be preferred, uh, but just making available those options will certainly be a very welcome uh, big uh, start. And may I suggest that in that in that uh, vein, we begin to ask the uh, people in low and middle income countries what their preferences are. We are asking about inject injectables at the moment, but we have not really examined all the other uh, options that are available. Thanks. Thanks, Kenley. So, so perhaps I could uh, pass that to Brent Rahab and Moses about what your preferences would be. I mean, Kenley set that question there, so we, we, could, we could get that moving now and, and see three different perspectives. So should we start sure. with you, Brent? Uh, um, I think, it, just to begin with, I think this, the discussion has been fantastic. This is so exciting to hear about all of this new tech that is happening. I think um, there's a couple of things. It, it, the second question in particular that's on our screen at the moment, for me, Moses mentioned cost. And this is the cost of the drugs. But I think we need to extrapolate what cost means from the patient perspective. The cost can be about the time it takes uh, to, to, to deliver the drugs, to, to take the drugs. The, there's a cost in terms of obviously what it costs the end user um, to purchase, but there's also productivity costs here. You know, what are the side effects that that, we're, that we are and can expect to implement to, uh, sorry, to affect our quality of life? I think those are some of the things that I'd, I'd like to talk about. I think um, Gustavo talked about this, transport and storage is critical in the in this area, you know, when we're talking about migrant and mobile populations who are at high risk of uh, HIV progression and, and transmission and acquisition, I think we have to think about transport and storage. And, you know, just to close off that in the very first session, there was this, there was this session, there was a, a quick note about stigma in healthcare settings. I think we do need to talk about what sometimes our healthcare providers and, and patients as well have around the stigma associated with, with novel delivery items and technologies and start challenging that at the point in which we do our clinical trials. Um, and finally, I think we do also need to acknowledge as someone living with HIV, how important it is that we continue to participate in these studies. I talked about this in my rapid fire about innovation. You know, none of this is gonna happen unless we continue to participate and thanking everyone living with HIV and those who aren't, but have participated in the prevention trials, you know, how much their participation means for the rest of us around the world. Oh, thanks. Uh, I, I wonder if we could just get, get quickly the perspective of uh, Rahab and Moses and then pick up on, on, on some of the things you've said, Brent, uh, uh, with, the, with the developers. Yes. Uh, first and foremost, I want, to thank, I want to thank the organizers of this uh, meeting. It has been very, very, very powerful. Uh, to me, as a person who has lived with HIV for three decades, the biggest challenge that I want to emphasize is educating me, the person who is gonna use this intervention. I mean, we need to empower communities about these interventions. We need to empower them about its importance, how it was made, that's really very important. I want to quickly give an example. In the year 2000, when I was switched to a, 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 a PI, uh, which had just been introduced. That PI had, had to be kept in a fridge because it melts in hot, it used to melt in hot temperatures. But several folks of mine didn't take that medication because uh, they had rumors that actually it was made out of fats uh, of, of pigs. And since they were Muslims and Muslims don't eat pork, so they didn't take this medication. And just because they were not empowered enough uh, during uh, the inception, they did not use the product. So we need to educate our communities and we need to find ways of fighting the myths and misconceptions that will crop up. Thank you. Uh, really important, Moses. And um, I, I just now, maybe uh, I, and with Helen, we can move to the, the developers. There's a couple of things. I mean, is the new developments coming, there are coming, the problems we've seen problems with all the drugs all of them have, have got issues either resistance or we've had uh, formulation issues we've had the lymphopenia but even if those things are solved uh, it seems to me that the 
cost of drug won't be the big major issue because you're using relatively small amounts per annum. Would it be the actual delivery platforms that are going to be the problem for us in development? And as Brent said, that the way that these delivery platforms are actually delivered to patients. And I, I just wondered, uh, maybe Charlie, we could start with you and then we can move on uh, to the others to ask about that. Uh, thanks, Anton. Yeah, the manufacture of these long acting formulations is obviously more complicated and more expensive than a traditional oral tablets or capsules. Um, and this is particularly problematic in moving these formulations into a generic marketplace for low and middle income countries. There is a substantial upfront investment required in new manufacturing lines to turn out a parenteral um, uh, long acting formulation or a, a delivery product like an implant as compared to uh, taking an existing manufacturing line for a pill, a one kind of pill, and switching it over to a different kind of pill. And, and so these are, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to solve this in the next five minutes. Uh, but this is a, a enormous, enormously large and complicated issue that's going to require input from pretty much all of the stakeholders uh, who have an interest in the possibility of delivering these formulations more broadly in low and middle income countries. It's a very important issue. And I'd love to hear from the folks at Vive and Gilead and Merck about this because, you know, their perspective on this, I think, is also critically important. Thanks, Charles. And I think that is a great segue. I'm going to go in, in reverse order to the presentations that we heard. So I don't know, Martin, if we can start with yourself um, to give some reflections from, from Gilead and then um, pass on to Kathleen and then Alex. Uh, thank you, Anton and Charlie, uh, for great questions. Very difficult and challenging questions. Um, first, I think in developing uh, long-acting uh, antiretroviral agents, one of the biggest challenges is actually find, finding a good agent, right? Uh, that is really potent enough that you could dose it uh, much, much less frequently uh, than daily. And uh, all the, the associated costs, right? Um, yes, there is the manufacturing cost, but also um, I think it was Brent who mentioned uh, the long timeline cost too. Uh, it takes longer and uh, it, it does, it does, it is more, I have to say more complicated uh, than uh, your, our typical uh, daily tablets. And so uh, we'll have to, I think all of us will have to really work hard uh, to make these great innovations uh, accessible uh, to as many people uh, living with HIV and uh, many people who would benefit uh, by taking these medications as uh, prevention um, as well. Uh, so I guess it's my turn. Um, I, I will say right up front that I am not... Uh, an expert on manufacturing, so I can I could only speculate um, in that realm. But I, I think in terms of thinking about how to study long-acting formulations, uh, it's more complicated because you have when you're thinking about doing clinical trials and so forth, you have these dyssynchronous arms. You have people who the standard of care to date right now, now I'm talking specifically about treatment is daily treatment. And then you want to look at your experimental arm where you're trying to give long acting types of regimens. Um, and so, you know, thinking about how to do that, but then also I'm a treater as well. I, I still see patients um, and I know there is great interest on the part of people living with HIV to be able to take medication less frequently than daily. Um, and, you know, we think that that's very easy to implement, but it's not. When you think about how, um, you know, care has been set up uh, for HIV infection and, and the way we monitor uh, patients and we bring them in, this would require some change in that. Um, and so trying to figure out how to study that in the context of clinical trials to be able to inform for clinicians and for people living with HIV, how they could incorporate um, these regimens you know, in, into their activities. I think those are all challenges that are unique to, to this um, kind of next wave for, for long acting regimens. 
So just a couple of comments along those lines. I guess I'll, Thanks, I'll uh, I'm a caboose here. Yeah. So, um, um, you know, Charlie, raised some really great points early on um, that I think manufacturing is going to become much more of an issue now with these long acting agents, whether it's a nano suspension or an implant or a patch or whatever, manufacturing really becomes an integral component now to the development of these molecules and agree with what Kate has said as well, that it's just more difficult to design these trials because by the very nature of the agents, it's longer, it takes longer to get results because these are long acting agents. So the rapidity that we're normally used to from you know, original phase uh, molecules, um, that, does, that doesn't happen anymore. And I, the, the final point that I would make is a regulatory one. Um, there, there is not necessarily a well-charted path for any of these formulations or platforms moving forward with respect to regulators. So in many respects, we, you know, the innovators are blazing new trails with regulatory agencies and there's, there's really no precedent to follow. And so that I would say also, and, and, you know, especially with these new agents and new platforms, there's kind of a natural tendency to conservatism with, with regulators. So you know, these are all things as I think as innovators, I'm seeing a bunch of heads nod that, um, that we're, we're battling with um, or, or challenged with now with the development of long acting agents. I think everybody sees the value of them, but they may not come as quickly as we would hope, at least at the beginning until we kind of have more well-worn paths um, for both for manufacturing and, and regulatory. So, so thanks. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I just want to, before we hand over to Helen for a final thoughts, just, just to say that uh, I find it remarkable after listening to you guys that we've actually got something on the market in long acting that's actually been, uh, you know, been taken out there and being used by patients. So the, the thing about HIV is that we're resilient, we're innovative, we get things going. And I hope the regulators will use some of the knowledge they got from COVID and how quickly they regulated vaccines and things and, and drugs for COVID into, and keep that in their space so that we can develop new things safely, of course, uh, for HIV. So I, I, I'm, I really think this conversation could go on for hours, but unfortunately we have a, a, a very short period of time to do this in. So I'm gonna hand over to Helen for any final thoughts. Thanks, Anton, and thank you, uh, a massive thank you to all of our speakers and, and contributors today. I think it's been a really rich discussion and has formed hopefully a very strong base and foundation for the next two round tables in our series, where we'll dig deeper into um, some of the challenges that have been surfaced today, but think about how a collaborative action can, can drive the availability of these products um, in the future in low middle income countries in particular. So focusing in those sessions on service delivery and access. So I do hope that uh, all of you are able to join those um, with us. So um, just a couple of pieces to close out. So this, the presentations that you've seen today have been recorded and they will be made available to all participants uh, by the IAS in the coming weeks, as will minutes. Um, from today's session which have been developed as well and um, we would ask you as always we want to make sure that these sessions are productive for participants and all the shareholder uh, not shareholders the stakeholders who participate in these and um, so please do fill in the survey um, that is sent round by um, Nelly and the IAS team so we can make sure that these sessions are of value to you um, and so the next session is on the 25th of May um, I'm sure that Nelly and the team will be um, sending you a reminder of the dates to make sure that you have got it in your calendars and registered and we very much look forward to continuing this the discussion with all of you there so thank you for, for joining us today thank you all thank you thank you very much Bye. Bye.